Hello, hello, hello. Ooh, that reverberates. Guys, welcome. Um, it looks as though pretty much everyone, nearly everyone, was here last week. Um, and for those that weren't here last week, just um, an additional welcome. And uh, yeah, it, this is part of a journey that we are going, uh, exploring prayer, different aspects of prayer, praying together, sharing, and hopefully um, growing in our prayer life. So as we've said before, it's not a course. It's not, you're not gonna get notes or anything like that, but I think um, those learnings will be inscribed in our hearts, hopefully, and those are better than paper. Um, so last week we had um, a whole group from Pinelands Baptist here, and uh, their minister, Craig, um, shared with us a few nuggets um, most of you can probably still remember some of those. I think one of the things that came up for me was just, again, the, the um, on the one hand, John Atkinson would always say, on the one hand, this, on the other hand, that. On the one hand, calling God Abba, um, Dad, and having this close connection with him. And on the other hand, his holiness and the power and might, and having that and yet being able to be so close when we pray um, and we had quite a few out of the community share um, some wonderful principles um, that or learnings that they shared with us so we're going to continue with that tonight um, and we decided to do it in-house tonight and um, uh, share amongst ourselves and John is going to take us through that tonight um, uh, just uh, some logistics. We've got Ali um, organized for us a bit of a kind of a register form that please take some time and write your name and contact on here. Um, the reason being is just so that we can just connect and update if there's anything there. And also uh, we have recorded last week's session and we are recording tonight as well. So the idea is to be able to go back, listen to what has been shared and um, yeah, let the Holy Spirit speak through, through those ones as well. So I'm just going to part this. So, just before we get started, I'd just like to open up in prayer. Let's just invite God into this space. And Lord, we, we are so grateful that you love to partner with your children, with us. And for you, it's all about um, kingdom on earth, bringing kingdom into, into earth spaces and connecting with you, and it's a two-way process, and we thank you for that. And we know that you, Jesus, when you walked the earth, you had so much that you taught your disciples, and we want to sit at your feet today and learn more, and spend time just, yeah, with you on our own, but also with each other. We want to share stories of how you have, what you've done in our lives. So I pray that you will stir our hearts tonight. I pray that you will open our hearts to, to receive, to hear you. I pray a special blessing over John as he shares with us tonight. Will you use him? Holy Spirit, you are so welcome here. Will you come and just be in our midst? Last week, someone said it felt as though he could actually feel Jesus standing next, next to him um, and looking in. And he thought it might have been Craig. And when he opened his eyes, he, Craig wasn't there. So, um, yeah, Jesus, you are so real. We want to feel you and experience you tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.
Yeah, we're going to start with asking people to yeah. share issues. So, so part of the question that we were um, um, th that Pinelands Baptist um, Church was was sharing was what was stirring in their hearts, or individually or corporately, and so we just want to put the question out there and say, what is God stirring here? What is he stirring in your heart? Um, and, and maybe just open the floor, first of all, and to hear from, from one or two or three of you. Oh, thank you. Um, now I would want to press OK, because that's so used to on Zoom, <laughs> to press OK. So is there anyone that feels um, they would like to share what God is stirring in you at the moment? Mm. Can we use this one to pass around or, oh that one up there. Shall I use it? This one. This one. It's just easier for people to hear. Do you want me to stand or sit? Or dance? I thought you speak loud. Dance, Jerry. Dance. Yes. yes. I'll, I'll face people. Yes. Right. Goodness. Hello. Um, so my, my experience of prayer is really like riding a motorbike with a sidecar, um, and Jesus and I, or the Holy Spirit and I, take turns where we are, and that's how I go through life. Um, and I, that's how I, I've gone through life for, for years and years and years, and, and we talk to each other. And, and think thoughts to each other. And, and it's fairly fruitful, I think. But, I, but then I hear people talk about prayer in a different kind of a way, um, in a very serious, reverent, holy way, like a holy time, a holy prayer. I'm useless at, well, you know some of the things I'm useless at, but one of them is having a quiet time. I have never been able to have a quiet time. And, and so I go through life, you know, hearing people talk about these things that you should do. Some people, just using the word prayer, they say it so reverently. Prayer makes me feel so insecure, so utterly useless. But actually, I just keep driving my motorbike and sidecar. And so I thought, well... I always wanted, you know, I'd like to be better. I'd like to do things better. I, you know, that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jerry. <laughs> Are you in the sidecar or on the motorcycle? <clears throat> Who's talking to you? <laughs> you. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> yes, Tracy. enjoyed prayer but but just me and Jesus on our own and um, enjoyed connecting with with Jesus but then um, but and, and corporate praying communally just terrified me I, I never had anything to say my mind would just go blank it was something I really avo avoided and um, then during COVID the only spiritual or um, church time I got was on Zoom, and there you had to pray with everybody, and oh, it was absolutely terrible. I'd, I'd have to like spend while everyone else was praying. I'll have to try and work out like what am I going to say and how am I going to say it, and then I'd like bumble out a few words. But there was something in it that really 
drew me, and I just kept going for more punishment. And, um, <laughs> um, and it's just been such an amazing journey, just learning to, to um, learning from others, which has been incredible, and, um, but, and then sitting and listening with others. But the best part is just how the Holy Spirit is just so much more powerful in a, in a communal space than, than a one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, it, there is that, but it's just mm. the Holy Spirit never fails to show up in communal prayer. And that's what I feel a stirring. That, that's something we need mm. to grow in. And if I feel if I'm nervous about it, I'm sure the other people will are too. Yeah. Mm. Thanks, Tracy. Anyone else? Shamulo, yes. Uh, good evening. I think for me, standing here now is, yeah, it's a, it's a progress. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what God has been doing recently in my life is that since I've joined the Alpha Prayer, I've I found praying being comforting and not only praying for myself. In such a way that when my friends now call me and tell me about their issues back in the days, I'll have a lot of things to say, but I don't even whatever that I'm saying was making sense. But now I'm able to say, do you mind if we can just pray? Mm. And um, as Tracy said, you know, it's not easy to open your mouth and say things because you don't even know what you're saying. But I, I found that the Holy Spirit takes over and you, you pray and after prayer you hear someone going like, how did you know? about the things that you have said, and that's why I start realizing that the Holy Spirit actually just wants us to be available rather than us thinking about what we're supposed to do. So that's what I'm mm. seeing God doing now. Thank you. Thanks, Lamulo. Sure. One or two more that would like to share? Thanks, Jessica. Hello, I guess largely because of the effects of my car accident, which is some 25 years ago now, and the need for rehabilitation of very many broken bones. Um, I recovered from that, but then two or three years ago, I broke my hip, like really, very badly. And I rehabilitated in water. And this was just in our little splash pool at home. But subsequently, I now swim at the Claremont Gym, probably for about 40 minutes, twice a week. And um, I don't know which has come first. The fact that I look forward to it so much because it's such a wonderful time of prayer for me. So I've written a number of articles actually called My Watery Temple because <laughs> I, I now, you know, that like it was really cold today, but I needed to swim today. But it's, uh, well, you can go, you can do it because you can talk to God all the way while you swim. And I fortunately am really indebted to Eugene Peterson, who's an absolute hero of mine, um, who suggested trying, starting with the Psalms, but trying to memorize a verse from each Psalm. Um, and I didn't set the bar very high, started about 10 years ago, um, and just trying to remember like one verse a week. Mm. And I, I now have a verse from most every psalm in my head, plus some others. So I've got a lot of liturgy to, to actually refer to when I'm swimming. Mm. And uh, I know Alison was a bit surprised that I swim and, and that this happens. And so I thought, well, maybe I'd better share it. So that's... That's an interesting place to pray. Lovely. Mm. <laughs> Only if you pray, Jerry, with her. <laughs> 
Should we carry on? Or yes. Natasha? Yes. It's going to be quick. I, I just want to say that's why I'm here, is to hear these stories, because all of them have rung true in different ways. So let's do more of it. Thanks, Natasha. Over to you, John. Mm. We'll have another time a bit later where you can share more and slightly different emphasis, hopefully, but <clears throat> we'll give you another chance. Um, sorry, I just want to put this on. So we titled this um, series, Talking with God, this exploration, if you like, Talking with God, which is very um, well known as an idea that we, we are, sorry, I can't get it to go ahead. We are in a conversation with God when we pray. And I like this Tim Keto quote, prayer is a, the continuation of the conversation that God started. We don't start it, he, he began it. And one can go to that in great depth all the way to Adam and Eve and so on. But God started the conversation with us. Then I want to start by showing you the four rules that Kelvin had. Now John Kelvin, 500 years ago, famous man, origin of Kelvinism to a point, and um, a lot of people got questions about him, but he had some very good approaches to prayer. And his first rule of prayer, now rules are really, you know, these are not, not the rule, it's more like this is what you need to have a good, life, good prayer life. Um, and the first one is to have reverence, the fear of God. And he said that we come into God's presence, uh, I just need to quote it properly, we come and we tremble with the privilege of being in his presence, and in that presence, we long to honor him because we understand to whom we speak. So the reverence or the fear of God is understanding to whom you speak. Um, the second one which comes out of that is therefore we, be, we become humble. We, we know humility because of, we know who, to whom we speak and then we know total dependence on him. And he said we become keenly aware of our true dependence on God and ready to recognize and repent of all our faults. Next step is that we submit in trust and confidence and confident hope, willing to leave all our needs and all our desires in his hands alone. And then he ends with, remember the rule of grace, by which he means that God does this, not us. We come into his presence because we're allowed into his presence because of Christ's blood, not because of what we've done or what we, we've achieved. And Ephesians 2.18, he quotes, for through Christ we both, that means Jews and Gentile believers, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. We have access. We don't earn access. We don't grow into access as we mature. We have access from day one of being born again. We have access to the Father by one spirit. We allow that access by grace. In, in the Hebrews, says, uh, Hebrews 10, we approach the throne of grace to receive mercy with confidence. We come with confidence because we know we have access. It's been given to us. So I'm going to talk. That's just to remind me to not show any more slides for a bit about my own experience and I'm grateful that Jerry's here because we're brothers in this one at quiet times, daily quiet times does, do, don't, don't work with me. Um, but I grew, <laughs> I grew up in an evangelical home of note and deeply steeped in scripture union and all these different groups and so on and of course the daily quiet time was bread and butter. You had to have a daily quiet time. And so when I was in my early teens, I began doing that as I was told to. But the quiet time required reading your Bible and praying. Two, two steps. And even today, one of the big evangelical organizations I won't name says that the four primary disciplines that every believer needs are daily, re daily reading your Bible, regularly studying your Bible, memorizing verses, Jessica talked about that, and pray. And actually, show me in the Bible where it says you must do that. The praying is, the Bible is full of you must pray. But the Bible doesn't say you must daily read your Bible, study your Bible, and memorize verses. That, those are good ideas. But they're not commands that this is part of our, <laughs> our discipleship. I, I was in a seminar group with a, a well-known, was a well-known uh, worship leader about six, five, six years ago. He's now old, in his 80s. And um, he said, my father couldn't read the Bible because he couldn't read. So what's he supposed to do? And actually, 100 years ago, many 
uh, a high percentage of the church could not read the Bible because they didn't have one or they couldn't read. 500 years ago, pretty much, pretty much nobody could read the Bible because it was in Latin. And so, you know, this requirement is a modern requirement and it's not actually a requirement of the Bible. It's a good idea and it's great. We have the technology to print Bibles. We have the technology now to read them on our phones. It's, not, it's a great boon, but it's not what is required. What is required is we become close to God in prayer. We relate to our Father. We, we talk to Him and converse with Him. So I did it for a while because I thought I had to. I had this, these little prayer ideas. One of them was from a hymn, God me, guide me, keep me, feed me. And I'd, I'd pray that for my mother and my father and my siblings and my friends and, and you know, just got to get lost in it. and I sort of run through the list and I had lists and I ran through the lists. And um, I felt guilty if I didn't do it. And that was a bit of what Jerry was referring to. I felt guilty if I didn't do it. And then corporate prayer was also, is also part of evangelical life. There's no evangelical organization that doesn't have a regular prayer meeting, pretty much. And so you've got to go to these corporate prayer meetings and if, I would never go to a prayer meeting if there's any chance at all that I'd be asked to pray because I was very reserved, very self-aware and would not pray in public. And so I would leave meetings or not go to meetings if I knew that there's any chance that I could be asked to pray. And um, this brought, brings me to the, the whole point that discipleship in the church is averaged, usually to type A type personalities, but it's averaged. This is what you do and this is what everybody therefore should do. And we're all different. And we need to learn that we're all different. Personality types make the norm difficult. Some personality types. Um, ADHD on the other side, they, they're jumping from issue to issue and point to point. And their prayer, prayer meeting is different. And if an ADHD person leads a prayer meeting, it's chaos. Because you're jumping all over the place. But if I lead a prayer meeting, I want to go deep. I have an ultra-focused mind and I have this, this issue. Let's do, and then stop talking about that. I want to talk about this one. And notice, don't change subjects. This, we're still busy with this. And by the time I've heard from God about this and got a scripture in mind, I want to pray about this, you've moved on to three or four other subjects already. You know? So different personalities do different things in prayer. And we need to give ourselves permission not to conform to the norm. My grandfather taught me that during a sermon, if the, the preacher goes off the point, or is going off on a tangent, or is saying something which is totally irrelevant to you, you're not interested, or is boring, or is missing the text, whatever it is, you don't have to listen to him. It's not a sin to go wandering off in your mind about, and daydream about something else. It's not a sin to go and think about something else, or, or take out your phone and look at your, your emails, or your social media. <laughs> it's not a sin. Yeah, I mean, in his words, you can turn it around and say he's sinning because he's dropped the ball about giving me some good teaching, yeah. <laughs> etc. And so the same applies to, to prayer meetings, and it's not a sin to stay silent through a prayer meeting, and it's not a sin to not go to prayer meetings, but it's not a, it's not a sin to not have a daily quiet time, all these different things. The key is a relationship with God. And if your relationship means you ride in a sidecar, or you swim in a temple, that's, that's fine. Find your, find your way. The other point about prayer formulae, you know, the famous one is Acts, A-C-T-S. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication, which means asking for things. Where's intercession? That that's, you're praying for other people when you intercede, not supplicating. But those formulae are very helpful. But one of the, the phrases I've heard about them is they are the lowest form of prayer. Not that they're rubbish, not that they're low in terms of useless, but they're the entry level. That's where you start, and then you grow, and you find your way, and you, find, you, you can dispense with them after a while. Um, I, don't, I haven't used daily reading notes or mnemonics to pray for decades, absolute decades. But when, that, when people start talking about this latest one, I start feeling guilty. I should be doing that, you know? Prayer lists are useful, but I'm at the stage now where I tear them up. I use them, but because I have an ultra-focused mind, I get through to three points, and then there's a whole lot of others that I haven't got to yet, I throw it away. And next time I come to pray, I make another new list. What is on my mind now? What is the Lord bringing me to pray about now? And I make a new list. And so that otherwise, I feel guilty, and I've got, to get, I've got to finish that list. I've got to finish that list. In six months' time, I'm still finishing the list from six months ago, and you know, it gets lost. Um, so find out what is your way. Your way might be daily quiet times. It might be. When Billy Graham asked his organization of 300 people who does daily quiet time, 
which was their bread and butter. 90% said they do not. 90% of Billy Graham's organization did not do their required time. So what is your, your way? It might be occasional prayer. It might be regular prayer. It might be praying through the day. It might be praying while you're on a walk. For me, spaces are important. And I find when we used to have a prayer, prayer room here, I would go there at 6 o'clock in the morning and there was nobody else there and it was quiet and it was set up as a prayer room and it would captivate me and I would pray there. That, was, that would suit me. So spaces suit me. Um, the other, another popular one today is Lectio Divina is a, a scheme of reading the Bible with contemplation. Um, it's like a monastic formula, uh, a reading, a meditation, a prayer, and a contemplation. And you go through it. And Pete Gregg and, and Nikki Gumbel have got this, uh, what's it called? Uh, Lectio, Lectio 365, which is so popular. And then I hear about it and I feel guilty because I haven't bothered about it. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't do anything for me. But some people find it wonderful. Some people find having a coffee break with Jesus is all you want. You know, go for a walk, have a coffee break, do whatever you like. Listen to music or singing music or worshipping is helpful. Pray reading the Bible. Some people find pray reading is so helpful. You just take the Bible and you, you read it to God. And you say, so what did you mean by that? Oh, that's fascinating. Thank you for that. And you, know, and you talk to God as you're reading the Bible. That's a very helpful way to do it. Um, but as I fr say, my brain is different, so I pray differently. And th that's how I am. And if I go to a prayer meeting and I'm, I don't find that I can pause and meditate on something focused and get into it, then I just stay there in my mind and the prayer meeting moves on and I stay there because that's how I do it. So it's all about you learning your way of relating to your Father God and um, what, what is best for you. And as you learn, it's like learning on the job, as you learn, as you walk, the Holy Spirit walks alongside you. And that's the promise. The Holy Spirit is there to help you. And we'll mention that again. But I want to then go on to opening the floor again um, with this question. What has the Holy Spirit taught you in your journey? Like I've talked about how I've learned some things. What has the Holy Spirit taught you in your journey? And what obstacles have you had to overcome? To me, I had to learn that I didn't have to conform. Who else wants to add to that? Hi, everybody. So um, I think for me, I, I grew up in a Methodist church, which I guess is evangelical. I'm not quite sure where it fits in. But um, as a child, I didn't like praying. And I would say as a young adult, I didn't like praying. I found it very boring. And I, I remember, I think I was about 20, and I actually I got signed up for the prayer team on a camp. And I was like how are we going to do this? And honestly, it was boring. It was like pulling teeth. Um, and then a few years ago, my husband and I were living in Franschhoek and um, we joined a charismatic church there, which, which was one of the only options there for us. And very soon we got to know the, the pastor and his wife quite well and they invited us to come on a weekend with them. So we thought, well, this is great. We, we're going to go on this amazing leadership weekend church planting weekend and they've chosen us and well they dropped us off and they left and the the very first activity was this huge massive charismatic hall full of people and we had to start prophesying over each other <laughs> and um what i learned there is i learned to hear the voice of the lord i i learned to hear the nudging as basic, and I must say the Lord does give me some pretty basic images, as they were, I learned to start trusting them. And I learned to love praying because I learned that that was how I could hear the voice of the Lord. And so for me now, when I pray, it's, it's like a bit of a drag because it's like, but, but I love to do it corporately. So that's my, that's my way, is I love to pray with people and I love to go down a rabbit hole and just to follow the, the lead of the Holy Spirit and to hear what he's saying and to trust it and to go with it. Um, so that, that's definitely, and for me now, prayer is so exciting, but it's because, it's because God is there, because the Holy Spirit is guiding me. It's not boring. And um, I was thinking about this today, as much as, as the word says that we should desire prophecy, is if we really do desire prophecy, we should love prayer. 
because that's the way to hear the voice of the Lord. So I think, I think for me, that's, that is what, is what has made the biggest difference. And then, and then the other thing for me was learning to hear the Lord for myself. It's, you know, it's easy to, to want other people to always give you a word and to give you direction. But over the years, so I don't, I don't know who of you are in the 11 o'clock service, but we have three children. They are this big, this big, and that big. Now, that is a very, fairly miraculous journey. And the journey of, of having those three children is a testimony to the fact that 16 or 15 years ago, when we realized that it wasn't going to be so easy, that the Lord said to us, you're going to have three children. And as much as many people said to us, but maybe it's just like spiritual children. We had heard the Lord. And yeah, that, that was an amazing journey, is to continue to contend for what we believe the Lord had told us. So that's been the other part of my journey. The second question is obstacles. Praying on my own. I find that more difficult. I crave the, the relationship of people with prayer. And that's, that's my challenge. So. Who else? So just hearing what has been said so far, it's amazing to me how everybody's different and how God meets, up, meets us at the point of our need or at who we are and who he made us to be. So for me, um, prayer and the Bible goes hand in hand. <laughs> I can't do the one without the other. And I'm one of those people who have quiet <laughs> Every day, sometimes for hours, just because God, God speaks to me through his word, and I've always been a prayer, but like you said, you like corporate, I like to pray on my own, and since I was a child, I've been a prayer, and um, what God is, how God has met me in, in my prayer time is where I've gone through very traumatic experiences and God would speak to me like I would, I would get a, like one time, I was going through a really difficult time and I was complaining, I was crying and I just heard God say to me, um, and it was from Job 38, where he says, who are you that obscures my counsel without knowledge? And I heard the, <laughs> he spoke, those words to me and I never even knew that it was in the Bible until I googled it and I was like oh my word this is from <laughs> so that is how God communicates with me he speaks to me the word and that has really helped me and it helps me and so that's why I say for me prayer um, I just made notes here prayer goes hand in hand and for me it's a tool because I'm a very creative person I get distracted very easily and I'm a very emotional person. So I think God uses the Bible to bring me, <laughs> bring me back in check. So it's a tool that God has given me that helps me, especially in my moments of weakness. So because he has given me this, um, this is my thing. So I will be going through a difficult time and I will pray that scriptures that I learned in my prayer time over myself, like that, the one about uh, pulling down every stronghold and demolishing every thought that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And so that is how God has, that is the, the, the tool that God has given me. And the greatest obstacle for me is um, getting distracted. I'm a single mom with three kids with endless to-do lists and... So what I do is when my mind is all over the place, I will sit down and I will write. So I will, I will write my prayer down. And then um, also when I'm in that emotional, <laughs> all over the place stage, I will read a psalm. And that is what helps me to get me, you know, just back into it, yeah. Thanks, any more? One little thing in terms of being different which came to me while I was facilitating my group on WhatsApp. 
Um, talking about everyone being different, I have nine grandchildren. I don't talk to each one in the same way that I talk to the other one. And I don't expect either of them to speak to me like any of the others do. So why should God be any different? Thanks. Somebody made that point last week with, when Craig was here, that uh, we all hear God in our own way. Or he speaks to us the way he knows our mind works. Okay, a lesser known theologian, Jonathan Howe, um, from the US, a very good quote. Prayer will not increase without intentionality. That means corporate prayer, nor your own life, will not increase without intentionality. In other words, you don't plan to do it. If you don't plan to do it, it won't happen. And then as you walk, Holy Spirit walks alongside. It's a very, to me, a very helpful quote that you need to be intentional. Although um, you don't earn anything by by praying, God wants you to come and talk to him. Same as a parent wants a child to come and talk to them. So your personal prayer life, our personal prayer life, we need intentionality. In other words, plan how you're going to do it. Even if it's like I'm going to spend Saturday afternoon walking with God or I'm going to do it whenever I get a chance with, for, to do a particular style of prayer. You know, but particularly um, if, you, if you need to have quiet, be on your own. Plan a time when you're going to be on your own and so on. Um, but choose what works for you. Don't choose something that is a pattern that somebody else has set down. Choose what works for you. And finally, ask Holy Spirit to teach you because he's promised to do so. So that's a sort of personal thing. Make a plan, what works for you, and ask Spirit to teach you. In, in amongst that is knowing who you're praying to and understanding your standing with him. Now we'll, we'll come to that in a moment. So translating that over into corporate prayer it requires intentionality as well, as Tracy was saying. Find people to pray with. And if we're in a community like in Christchurch, make plans to get people together to pray. So intentionality again. Secondly, what works for you needs to translate over into accommodating all, all styles, all types of prayer. And we can't do that in one prayer meeting. Um, one of the principles that they taught at HDB in the early 90s um, was you need lots of prayer meetings because there are lots of styles of prayer. And so some prayer meetings are mostly quiet and meditative. Others are silent. Others are noisy with music. Others are all pray together at the same time, etc. Lots of different ways. Praying in tongues, gifts. But accommodate all different styles. And then finally, uh, the same as the other one. Ask the Spirit to teach and to lead them. And this is an important point. For personal prayer, learn from one another. Corporate prayer, learn from one another. Don't try and do it on your own and read a book and read the Bible and so on. Uh, talk to one another. Ask people, so how do you do it? And in a, in a corporate prayer meeting, you're seeing a person praying succinctly, well, brief, powerful prayers. Say, how, do you, how did you get there? What was your journey? Can I maybe learn from that? And you hear a person talking about how powerful their prayer life is, how they love it and they enjoy it. Well, tell me why. How did that happen? And just help, let's help one another. So going back to the fear of the Lord. So in Luke 8 and the other Gospels, um, Jesus calms a storm. The disciples are in the boat. There's lots of disciples there, but we don't actually know who was in the boat. The, the Bible doesn't tell us. It just says the disciples. But they're terrified. Well, they're, they're frightened. They say, we are about to drown. Wake up, Jesus. What, we, what can we do? And he calms a storm. And then it says, the NIV says, they, they were full of fear and amazement. Actually, they were terrified. You look at the Greek, they were terrified. The, the, the scale of fear went from frightened of the storm and drowning to absolute terror. They realized who Jesus was, and he was con con controlling the storm. And a similar account is, there are many of them in the Bible, is Revelation 117, where John is ex exiled on Patmos. He's praying and, and worshiping on the Lord's day, and he hears a voice behind him. And he turns, and he sees the risen Christ. And he sees this unbelievably frightening, awesome picture. He talks about eyes like fire and a voice like thunder, a voice like many waters thundering. And um, yeah, there's, there's lots, lots of aspects to the thing, but it's, it's an amazing picture. And he falls down as though dead. 
When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. And nothing else in Revelation has its effect on him. You know, Revelation is a book of absolute terrors. But nothing else makes him fall as if, as if dead. But seeing Jesus, the risen Jesus does. And, sorry, I'm just finish that story. It doesn't want to go back. Okay. So, the next, actually, I think on the next slide, we'll do that. So, let's just go, go to here. The, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom is a fundamental proverb that is famous. But to dig into the actual meaning there is, is quite fruitful. Start understanding the awe of who this really is that I am talking to, that I have access to. Because it goes alongside with the access. I have access to this awesome person who went to the trouble of saving me. And that, that pair is, pairing those two is important. So I've called this the scary Jesus. It's from an article I read. Um, that Jesus is actually scary. And so he should be. But now Jesus responds to John's fear immediately by saying, it's okay. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, it's okay. Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am Yahweh. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and now look, I'm alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys to death and Hades. I am the same Jesus you knew. I am the same Jesus that was your best friend. It is still me. But I hold the keys of death and Hades. I am all powerful. And that is, that is the reality. But he says, do not be afraid. And the only way John cannot be afraid is to know who Jesus is and that he came for me. To know that this awesome, powerful God is the one who came for me. He came and died for me. He came and made me his. So I am his. I am on his team. And that then makes the fear become reverence. So you know, I, I've been in a position where I've been chatting away to a person, like a friend, sharing life and so on. But that person was the president of a country. And you hyper aware of who this person really is. You can't relax. You're just hyper aware of that. This, this really is, and how much more is it when you're speaking to God? So going back to Kelvin's rules, remember his first rule. Have reverence, the fear of the Lord. Know who you're talking to and know what he's done for you. Um, Andrew Murray wrote a book called With Christ in the School of Prayer. And he said, his, one of the, the most powerful quotes in that is, says, the power of your prayer depends almost exclusively on your perception of who you're praying to. So Matt Redmond, when he was still a teenager in the this, in this 90s, um, I brought this album, but I don't know the song because it's not an easy song to sing. But he wrote a song called The Friendship and the Fear based on this idea that we need both the friendship of Jesus and the fear or the awesomeness. And these are the, this is the, the chorus. Knowing you, hearing you speak, seeing you move mysteriously, hearing your whisperings in my soul's ear, I want the friendship and the fear of knowing you. I want both. So John's first comment about Jesus in Revelation 1 is Jesus is standing amongst us. So Jesus is still Emmanuel. You know, Emmanuel, God with us, he is still with us. And he said, I will be with, with you always. So he's now the awesome risen Christ, but he's still with us, still standing in our midst, still amongst us, standing here tonight with us. And if this one is for us, who could possibly be against us? That's what uh, Paul's getting at in Romans 8. If this amazing one is with, with us, is for us. So Jesus is with us and for us. And this is a fa famous and favorite verse of many people from Zephaniah. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. You know, he was known as the Lord of hosts, the Lord of angel armies. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, you, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. So there's no need to be afraid of him, just to be in awe of him. So we've been doing Revelation in the Good Portion Bible Study. And I just want to show you an outline of what we're learning from it. Firstly, there is a battle against evil. It's not an eternal battle. It's been going on for a long time and will go on until Christ comes again. He's won the victory on the cross. He will finalize that victory when he comes again. The battle goes on. The skirmishes go on, if you like. But there is a battle against evil. The risen Christ leads the battle. Clearly throughout Revelation, Jesus is in charge of the battle. And 
clearly throughout Revelation, we are on his team. So we're not watching, wondering what's going to happen. We're not in the background sort of hoping he's going to save us. We are on the team and we have a role to play and our main weapon is prayer. It's very clear in Revelation, our primary weapon is prayer. So what's the point of being on his team if we don't pray? I'm going to show you some of the, the less known prayer quotes in the Bible. And this one is quite powerful. Samuel says, As for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you. So it is sin to fail to wield the weapon that you've been given. We've been given. Uh, Paul in 1 Timothy 2, I urge then that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people. Not just those you like, not just those you're concerned about, for all people, which is a tall order. And then Jesus in Matthew 5 takes that a step further. I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So I pray even for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven, meaning that you may be like him, because he loves his enemies. He's all the time trying to reach everybody with his love, so we may be like him. And in Matthew 26, in the garden, Jesus says, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Because a person who doesn't pray doesn't hear God's voice whispering. They hear temptation's voice whispering. And we miss out on God's whisper and we hear temptation's whisper. And Romans 8, just to introduce again the idea of the Spirit. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with, through wordless groans. And this leads into discussions of all sorts of prayer, praying in tongues, prophetic prayer, corporate prayer, and, and private prayer, and so on. All sorts of ways we can draw from this, how the Spirit helps us. But that's for the future. The next few weeks we will go into a lot more different, different aspects of prayer. So, to end, prayer is fundamental for every single believer. It's not an optional extra, it's not a last resort, it is part of who we are. Now, what I want to do what Diana named a silent audit. I want us to ask the questions in our hearts, and you can answer them brutally honestly because only you and God hear the answers. God knows the answers already, by the way. So answer these for yourself, and let's just be quiet as we do it, and see how we assess what's going on in our lives. Firstly, do you pray on a regular basis, remembering that regular doesn't mean you have to do the particular pattern. Ask yourself that question. Not yet. And then secondly, if you do, when do you do it? And the point about that question is, oh yes, no, I think I pray every day, but hold on, I don't. Well, I think I pray at least once a week, but no, hold on, I don't. You know, just be honest with yourself. When do you pray? How often do you pray? For how long do you pray? And what do you pray about? How broad is your ap application of prayer? And the third question, are you satisfied with your prayer life, given your life circumstances, because you know, some people want to pray three, six hours a day, but because of your life circumstances, you can't. But given your life circumstances, are you satisfied with how your prayer life is? And it's a little bit like asking, are you satisfied with how your relationship with God is, or with Jesus? And the final challenge is, how satisfied do you think God is which turns it around. And the second part, corporate prayer. How much experience do you have of corporate prayer? Do you think, compared to average, do you think you like average? Do you think you go to many more prayer meetings than most people? Or do you go to very few or none? Where do you put yourself on the scale? And then secondly, do you generally avoid prayer meetings? Not that you won't go to one, but you're nice, it's nice to have an excuse. You know, something else is on. And why?
the why might draw many uh, honest points, such as they're mostly old people at the prayer meeting. Or they just pray forever. One person prays for 10 minutes. I can't stand that. Or they don't pray at all. It's just silence. This is these long, awkward silences. They're so boring. Or they pray gossip. In other words, they tell one another what's going on by praying for it. And others. Or just you don't want to pray in public. You're just scared of praying in public or you don't feel comfortable doing that. So if you avoid prayer meetings, why do you do it? <coughs> can you think of a prayer meeting or prayer meetings that you have enjoyed? Now, Tracy, obviously you can. And why did you enjoy it? That's the point. Why did you enjoy it? If you can think of one. And finally, how satisfied do you think God is with our church's corporate prayer life? Like, it's okay, shame, they're doing, they're doing their best. Or uh, they're being appalling. Or, yeah, I'm so pleased with them. Where, where do you think he's sitting on that? Now, I don't want answers to these. This is for your own meditation, if you like. But we do want you to write something down in groups of three. So get into groups of three, and what we, I want you to do is <clears throat> share with one another what one thing do I really, really want to learn or grow in. It might be going to prayer meetings, it might be praying in public, it might be personal prayer, it might be daily prayer, it might be praying without ceasing, all sorts of things. What is the one thing you think you would like to really learn about or, in, or grow in? And then write that down. We've got some pieces of paper. Don't put your name on it. We just want, want a sort of sample of what people are thinking as we plan the, the rest of these evenings. So what do you want to learn about? What do you want to grow in? Where, how do you want to grow in prayer, both corporate or private, or both? So in your small groups, write that down and share it with one another. Then pray for one another's one thing. So whatever people have shared, pray for that one thing. But important, include silence and ask God to speak encouragement to yourself for that person or to one another for that, for that person, for that thing. Um, I've got a, a, a little quote from somebody, I forget her name now, but she defined prayer as stopping and hearing the voice and then responding, which is an amazing way of turning it around instead of praying and then waiting to see if there's a response but stopping hearing the voice and then responding. So decide how to do it in your group. You might want to keep silence first before praying for the one thing, or you might want to pray for the one thing and then keep silence. But keeping silence first does make a little bit more sense. Pause, listen for the voice, and then respond. And we'll do that for, I don't know what the time is. What's the time? Somebody? Okay, so we've got about 20, 25 minutes, 20 minutes. Let's make it 20 minutes. <laughs> in groups of three.